u star, then the conditions on um, things like the normalized trace of a polynomial of x, they become conditions uh, on the integral of this polynomial against the, the measure, uh, the delta masses at the eigenvalues. And um, so more or less, you, you, um, you, you're looking, I mean, you're prescribing the, the moments of this measure. So more or less, you're, you're fixing where these eigenvalues are going to be, right? And then the question is how to compute the volume of, of the set of all matrices whose eigenvalues are approximately the correct thing. And that is, of course, the usual integral, which will bring in this, this Vandermond term, lambda i minus lambda j. And that what, what will tell you that this logarithmic volume uh, will be related to sum of uh, log lambda i minus lambda j. Uh, and so that will, in, in, in the infinity limit, uh, will converge to uh, the, logarithmic uh, the logarithmic energy plus, well, there's some constants that are involved in this normalization. Okay? And um, somehow this computation is can be phrased in a different way. This is what was done by in, in a fundamental paper of Ben Arous and Alice Guionnet, who repackaged this, if you like, a, as a large deviation principle. So this, this uh, chi becomes a rate function in that, in that approach. So this is, again, the case of one matrix, d equals one. Now, for d not equal to one, the whole thing is a bit more mysterious, but still nice. For example, you still have minimization or sorry, maximization of this relative entropy by semicircular variables. I didn't write it, but it's still true. Um, you still have that freeness is characterized, well, okay, uh, yeah, I think it's characterized in this case by equality, by, by the fact that the entropy is the sum of the individual entropies, and in the case uh, that, that it's not minus infinity. And in addition, you have a very nice thing which is called the change of variables formula. So to set this up, it says that if I take yj some, well, you can take some kind of analytic function of xj. So think of this pj as some kind of a convergent power series or something like this, a non-commutative power series. Oh, I, I wrote it wrong. Sorry, it's uh, p, p should be of, of all variables. Sorry about that. I, I'm assuming that yj is pj of x1, xn, xd. And let's assume also that xj is some qj of y1, yd, where this p, uh, p and q, they are some kind of non-commutative power series. Then um, there's a very nice formula that tells you that uh, the entropy of the y's, so the entropy of the functions of x1, xn, are just the entropy of the, fun of the variables themselves, plus a correction term which has to do with a kind of Jacobian. So you take these different quotients, uh, you um, make a matrix out of them by differentiating pi with respect to in direction j. Uh, this is going to be some matrix in your phenomenon algebra tensor itself. You take the absolute value of it, you take the log of it, and you take traces. So this is a kind of a determinant, if you like. It's a determinant of a derivative. So it's a kind of a Jacobian term that corrects the whole thing, uh, log of a determinant. OK, um, if you want to prove this, it's not so complicated. I mean, you just have to understand how applying such functional calculus distorts volumes on, uh, on matrices. And that's not so hard. So basically, this expression will approximately tell you how volume is distorted. And then, then the rest is just a, a fairly easy computation. OK, so the big and only result in the subject, really, uh, I mean, in this, in this chi versus chi star subject, is this theorem of Philippe Bian, Ray Capitaine, and Alice Guionnet, which gives an inequality. It says that this chi, chi remembers the thing that is computed with matrices. How many matrices do we have that model a given law is bounded from above by chi star. So I want to give, uh, I mean, this is a, a very non-trivial Invencionis paper. Uh, but I want to give a, a, a caricature of the proof. Uh, I mean, it's Friday evening, so I can kind of lie to you, right? So I will lie to you enough to make it simple. 
Actually, I think it's not so bad, a lie. So the idea is, um, so I just put back uh, the definition of, uh, of this chi. Yeah, it's the limit of log volume, blah, 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 where this blah, blah, blah is defined here. Yeah, so all these sets of approximations. All right. Now, let's say it in a different way. Let's call gamma n simply the Lebesgue measure restricted to the microstate space, and let's renormalize it to make it a probability measure. Then actually what happens is that this, this free entropy, chi, is more or less the limit of the classical entropies of these guys. Okay? Moreover, if you're interested in semicircular perturbations of x1, xn, then you can see uh, the entropy of this guy as the limit of classical entropies of um, Gaussian perturbations of these gamma and t. Okay? So that, that formula is not so hard to establish. Um, what did I want to say? Oh, yes. Now, the idea is to prove that the two things are equal. You want to check two things. One, when t equals infinity, this is true. Well, that's obvious. I mean, when t equals infinity, you have so many semicirculars here that your x's are forgotten. So it's just a semicircular n-tuple. And here, you have added so much Gaussian noise that you forgot where you started, and so you just have a ball of some radius. You make the computation, you're done. The next thing that you want to do is you want to check that the, fit that, uh, the derivatives in t of these quantities are the same, or at least there's an inequality between them, because then you can conclude. So what you want to do is you want to compute d chi of x1 t x n t versus d uh, d t d chi star of x1 t x n t. Okay, and now I'm going to cheat and say that actually this is something to do with the limit as n goes to infinity, one over n squared. And here I will have the Fisher information, the classical Fisher information of x1 t x n t, whereas here I will have phi star of x1 t x n t. Okay? All right, fine. So uh, entropies go the opposite way with Fisher information. So to prove uh, this, I think I need to prove that, if I'm not mistaken. So that's what I'm trying to do. All right. Um, now, for this, I have, I have a formula in principle. What is this thing? This is the conditional expectation onto the algebra generated by your x1, t, xn, t of Sn, uh, or Sj. Well, you have to divide this by, you have to sum the L2 norms of these things, sum over j, uh, and divide it by t, to be precise. And you have a similar formula for here. This is 1 over t. There'll be this 1 over n squared, whatever, sum over j, conditional expectation of uh, some Gaussian, gj. And this conditional expectation will be on what? It will be on the algebra generated by the entries of, of your random matrices Uh, which come from the measure gamma n, gamma n t. Okay? All right. But now, now we're in business. We're in business. Why? Because um, this algebra is, so, is somehow smaller than this algebra. This algebra is more or less the algebra of all polynomials in your matrices. These are honest, non-commutative polynomials of your matrices, some closure of it. This algebra is a much bigger algebra. It's algebra generated by all the entries. So, of course, when I condition something on a bigger algebra, I will get more. That's it. Okay. So that's more or less the proof. All right. Now, the next question you can ask is, since there's, there's such a nice argument, maybe, that chi, chi is less equal than chi star and so forth, maybe you should actually go for the equality. I mean, that's, that would be nice. Of course, when d equals 1, there is equality. There is, unfortunately, a slight monstrosity that 
impedes progress. And this, this monster is called the cone embedding question. So the cone embedding question, very simply put, is whether these sets are always eventually non-empty. In other words, I give you abstractly a trace on some kind of an algebra. You know, it's a positive trace. These are operators in a Hilbert space all as well. So there are these variables x1, xd. Can I actually find finite matrices that approximate my guys in moments up to a certain degree? Now, in fact, there is a refinement, or you know, re, uh, there are many reformulations of this question. Um, you, uh, one way to say it is, does every separable tracial phenomenon algebra embed into something called the ultra power of matrices. And I'm not going to define that, what that is, but in reality, what that, what's written there is exactly this. But there's another reformulation uh, of it. Um, well, I won't tell you that one. Let, let me tell you this one. Um, for any u1, ud, in some phenomenon algebra, m tau, and for any epsilon, is there an n and capital U1, capital UD, which are n by n unitaries, with a property that tau of Ui star Uj is with an epsilon of tau of little Ui star Uj. So you just need moments of order two. And unbelievably, we don't know. Okay, so this, this actually, this, this question has lots of, uh, lots of interest. And um, there is now a connection with quantum information theory. There's something called uh, some, some Cyrilson problem that is associated with that. Um, it's also been studied a lot in C-star algebras and phonemian algebras for, for various reasons. It's also related, you may have heard, let me just say the word about what are sulfid groups. Um, you can ask this for a group. I mean, this is really the, maybe the simplest way of asking the question. Suppose I give you a group gamma, which is really given as generators and relations. So it's generated by G1, Gn, subject to some relations, R1, Rm. And even for, for the purposes of this discussion, even finitely presented, so finite number of relations. Okay. And suppose you, so can one find, so given this G1, Gn, uh, and a cutoff, a row, uh, can one find uh, unitaries, let's say U1, Un, such that, um, so of size, n by n, n large enough, such that, well, what I want to say is that things which are non-trivial in the group are non-trivial, and things which are trivial in the group are trivial, up to this radius rho. So for all word of uh, length at most rho, uh, this word of u1, un is approximately identity if, um, so approximately, really, in two norm. Uh, is less than epsilon. Well, let me, let me just say here, delta w equals e. So w, where w I, I evaluate, uh, let's call it v, where v is w evaluated in g1, gn. Yeah. So I simply want want unitaries which are, what do I want? I think, sorry, I'm saying it wrong. Yeah, I want a close to identity if, if W of G1, Gn is identity and far from identity, far from identity if not. 
Yeah, so I just want to be able to embed the group into the unitary group approximately so that all my relations up to some length are satisfied and nothing more. Okay? And uh, the, there's a similar question where you replace the unitaries by permutation matrices. And, and groups that have that property are called sophic groups. And one of the open questions is whether every group is sophic. So can you embed it in this way into permutations? And it's a question that seems to be related to the con question. Certainly, if every group were sophic, it would have to satisfy the con question. So that's, unfortunately, a, a big problem. So uh, Ali said that since there is the whole weekend in front of people, and there are so many people here that want to work very hard over the weekend, I thought I would. She, she wanted me to give a list of impossible questions. So I would like to give a list of impossible questions um, just in case uh, they're possible. I mean, heaven knows. So the first couple are really operator algebra questions. And I'm putting them mainly to tell you what motivated free probability theory and continues to motivate it in ma many ways. One, the first question is the famous question, which probably can be traced to von Neumann in one way or another whether these von Neumann algebras generated by the D should be N. I'm sorry, that should be, I think that's a perpetual problem I talk today. Um, whether the von Neumann algebra generated by D semicircular variables remembers D. Okay. And uh, there is a non-trivial result in free probability theory that says that there's a dichotomy. Either they don't at all. In other words, if I take two variables or 20 or an infinity, it's the same thing. Or they're all different. So it cannot be that the one on five generators is the same as the one on three generators, but the one on seven is the same as the one on four. That cannot be. But, um, but uh, the, the, the question still is whether it remembers D. And that is, that is a famous question. And, and, uh, and yeah. Um, incidentally, there is a similar question for C-star algebras, which I really like. Um, whether you look at the smaller thing, the C-star algebra generated by D semicircles, whether that remembers D. So the nice thing is there is that in that case, um, the unitary version of it was solved. If you take D free unitaries, each distributed uniformly on the circle, then yes, D is remembered. Uh, and that's a computation in K-theory, uh, which tells you that in the, the K1, the first K group of this, of this uh, guy is D minus 1, so that's remembered. But unfortunately, uh, the key theory of this c algebra is trivial, so actually nobody knows if, if that remembers D or not. So there you go. The next question is the con question. Um, you know, of course, there's an upgrade on the con question. Can you say that chi equals chi star? Um, and one uh, kind of um, one of the stumbling blocks, actually, to understanding chi versus chi stars to have what's called a change of variables for chi star. So I, I told you how to change variables. There's this form, nice formula with the kind of Jacobian for chi, prove the same thing for chi star. And nobody really has any clue, as far as I know. Now, I did not get to talk about this at all, um, but we had this paper with Alice a few years ago about analogs of transport in the non-commutative setting. So this is a, a, a situation where you try to construct explicitly a change of variables that converts one non-commutative law into a different non-commutative law. This is a highly non-trivial question in the non-commutative case for the following reason. You see, classically, if you look at a measure mu and on some, some space, and you look at the space of essentially, well, just look at it as a measure space, uh, this measure space remembers absolutely nothing about mu except for atoms. So as measure spaces, this is always 0, 1 with Lebesgue measure, uh, except if mu has atoms. Right? So, you know, there are no big obstructions to transport one probability measure into the other. It's just a question of exactly how to do this. Now, in the non-commutative case, uh, things are really bizarre. Uh, if you look at uh, two ones of tracial phenomenon algebras, which are supposed to be like L infinity of x mu, the non-commutative replacement for that, there are so many of them that they cannot even fit into one. There isn't a separable a Q a containing all of them. 
Okay? So you cannot even put them on the same, you know, inside one big phenomenon algebra. They, they kind of repel. If you try to do it, they fight so much, you know, it's, 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 it's over. So, so, um, so, so therefore, there are so many different isomorphism classes of these algebra that, you know, that be, it becomes very non-trivial to be able to say that this law has the same phenomenon algebra as that law, which of course is what you mean by a change of variables. But anyways, um, there are some hints that maybe uh, there is some order in the universe. I mean, the con question is a kind of a transport question. I told you that everything is, it's whether everything can be put into this algebra. Um, that's not separable, so it doesn't contradict what I'm saying. And uh, there is another famous question of von Neumann, whether every non-amenable von Neumann algebra contains a free group algebra. Okay, and so for example, you can weaken it by saying that if you have a d-tuple with finite entropy, does that imply that this algebra contains a free group factor? So that, you know, it's a very nice question. And, and the last thing that would be very nice to do, and, and you know, there's incremental progress on this every time that something happens. Sometimes it's a big increment, sometimes it's small. But uh, we would really like to understand what happens in general to limits of random matrix models. So you look at things like this with V being arbitrary, so not assuming convexity or some, some story that it's a small perturbation of a, of a quadratic potential or something like this, a re really very general potential. What happens in that case? For example, even if whether there's always a limit in this case, I think that's, that's open. There are limit points and then there are ways to characterize them, but unfortunately, nobody knows if there's always that. So I think I gave you enough, uh, enough stuff to keep you busy for a century, and certainly this weekend, so <laughs> it all remains is to thank you and, and uh, to say goodbye. Questions? Yes. They have to be inverses. Yeah, yeah I forgot to say, but uh, I'm sorry, is that what you ask? They have to be power series Yeah, the, the way it's, I mean, the, the only case where this is known, and I mean, you can probably extend it a little bit by taking some limits and so forth, but it gets a bit murky. But yes, you are assuming that yj is a power series of x1 through xd, so not just one variable, but a d-tuple. But then you're assuming that it's invertible. So there's another power series that inverts this power series, and you could go one way there. It just needs, you, you need a sufficiently good control of what happens on the matrix level. Um, you see, for instance, if you don't assume that they are invertible or something like this, that you get, you get into the question of how badly non-one-to-one -one can a non-commutative transformation be? And that's actually a very interesting question. I mean, I, I've, I'm quite puzzled by this, but you take a, a non-commutative, you know, a bunch of non-commutative polynomials. And you solve this, try to solve this system of equations. So here, B1, BD are given n by n self-adjoint matrices. And you want to solve for A1, AD which are of the same sort. How many solutions does this have? And it would be nice to know if 1 over n squared log of the number of solutions uh, goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. And I have no idea, but it, it, th there seem to be some mild indications that this may actually be true. I mean, of course, if you simply take algebraic equations in the entries, then all you would know is that this is finite. It's bounded by d, or d times the degree of the polynomials or something. So that's you know, one of the questions that go in that direction. Any other questions? Okay. If not, let's thank Dima again. Thanks.